All right, well, good morning, everybody, on uh, the first day of snow in Washington, or slight sleet or rain or something. Um, we were just talking, uh, Dar Daryl and I both used to live in Providence, and uh, <clears throat> a foot of snow was, uh, they'd still go to school. <laughs> just, just might be 10 minutes late. Uh, so anyway, uh, anyway, uh, welcome. Uh, uh, I'm glad you can join us this morning. I'm Rob Atkinson, president of ITIF, and uh, we're really uh, pleased that uh, Orrin Cass is uh, joining us this morning. Um, uh, I had the uh, pleasure of reading Orrin's book, um, I guess, you know, months ago when, uh, when it first came out, uh, right before it came out, uh, The Once and, and Future Worker. Uh, it's a very compelling uh, argument that Orrin makes, and, and it's, a, it's a bigger argument than I think you, you might sort of see it at first glance, because it's really an argument about saying, that American society went off track, I don't know, 40 years ago by, by really sort of embracing this notion that economic growth automatically benefits cons uh, workers uh, and, and sort of focusing on consumers all the time. Uh, and I think Warren has, is, 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 the book is really a, a, a well um, needed a sort of corrective to some of that extreme. Um, we we're talking about how, for example, the uh, Economists uh, generally have come up with the view that if you happen to be, uh, you know, uh, problematic enough to be in a community where there's been dislocation, that you know, just suck it up and move, uh, like the rest of us graduate degrees, the people who uh, are on LinkedIn and have no problem moving. Uh, and I think we've now seen in the last 10 years, in the last few years, that, that the real problems with that, and we need to rethink that. And one of the aspects of this is really about how should, if you're thinking about a world where the, we're putting worker welfare a little more central, what does that mean for uh, automation in the future of work, and how should we be thinking about that? So um, Oren's going to kick off uh, some remarks, and then we have uh, three panelists who will give their uh, responses to that, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, from you all. Uh, so introducing Oren, he's a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, focuses on labor market issues as well as environmental regulation, trade, immigration. Uh, he has written extensively in New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, etc. I mentioned his new book, uh, Once in a Future Wor Once in Future Worker, A Vision for the Renewal of Work in America. Uh, prior to uh, joining Manhattan Institute, he was also domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's 2012 campaign uh, and an editor of Harvard Law and also uh, a management consultant at Bain. Um, Brink Lindsay is uh, Vice President of Policy for the Niskanen Center. Uh, how old is Niskanen now, Brink? Three and a half years. Yeah, pretty new. And if you don't follow Niskanen, I encourage you to do so. They do really interesting, uh, important work uh, in a lot of spaces that we also work in. Uh, Brink has uh, written, and again, a wide variety of topics, trade policy, globalization, and nature human capital. Uh, prior to joining Niskanen, he was at the Cato Institute, uh, was also at the Marion Ewing, uh, Ewing uh, Marion Kaufman Foundation, which focuses on entrepreneurship. Uh, he has written or, or co-authored a number of books, uh, most recently a really interesting one, if you haven't seen it, The Captured Economy, How the Powerful Enrich Themselves, Slow Down Growth and Increase Inequality. And he is also from the Harvard Law School, so we're two for two. Or anybody from Yale Law? I don't, don't think so. Yale Law is ranked higher, Mark, to tell you that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, and uh, Daryl West, a uh, longtime colleague. Uh, uh, Daryl is the Vice President of Governance Studies and the Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at uh, Brookings. And where he focuses on tech issues, and in particular uh, has written a, a recent book uh, on uh, the future of work, uh, the future of work, robots, AI, and automation, which I encourage you to look at. Uh, prior to uh, joining Brookings, he was at the uh, director of the uh, Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University, where he focused on a lot of uh, governance uh, and political science issues. He's also the winner of the American Political Science Association Don K. Price Award for the best book on technology. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Jim Petrakis is uh, joining us from the miracle of uh, robots. Um, I told Jim, though, he, he should be careful driving that, uh, so I think he's not going to use the driving function, just the viewing function. Uh, uh, he is located way out in the boonies, and so the traffic, or the, uh, the roads actually are much worse out there, so uh, thankfully he can join us uh, uh, virtually. Um, he is a columnist and policy analyst, and the DeWitt Wallace Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where he writes uh, the AI and edits the AEI Ideas blog. If you, again, if you haven't seen that or subscribed, it's worth doing that. Uh, prior to AEI, he was a columnist for Reuters, Breaking Views, and uh, an editor uh, and columnist for U.S. News and World Report. Again, written many, many different uh, publications. Um, and I think the only person here who is a Jeopardy champion. Although we did have a panel. Outstanding. Yeah, but not as good as Ken Jennings. Oh, not nearly. Yeah. Or the robots. Or the ro or, or Watson. <laughs> Although we did have an event, Watson. believe it or not, several years ago where we had two Jeopardy champions on the same panel. So uh, it's not unusual, but uh, it's, it's a distinguished honor, but not definitely unusual. All right, Orrin, take it away. All right, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming, Rob, for, for hosting this, and especially the other speakers. It's, um, it genuinely is an honor to have folks as, as experienced and with, with such diverse perspectives uh, as these guys here to comment on the book. And, and I honestly don't know what they are going to say, and I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, I, I am sick of hearing about Jeopardy, though. I have to say, I, I emailed my dad on Tuesday to tell him how great the book was doing. He had to check out a review. He wrote back, okay, after Jeopardy's over. <laughs> and I said, well, that's fine. You know, your son's first book comes out several times a week, but when are they going to show another quiz show where they give you the answer and you have to find the question? Um, but he finished Jeopardy anyway. The, uh, the topic that, that I want to focus on today is, is the relationship between, uh, between technology and other forms of economic disruption and how we should understand that depending on how we think about what we're actually trying to accomplish. Uh, with our economic policy and in the economy generally. Um, this question was actually what in many ways motivated the book overall and, and I think the, the, the most specific example is the argument that I began to encounter in defense of free trade which was well free trade is no different from automation. Um, that in formal economic terms, and economists will make this argument, in fact, there's no difference between employing some new technology in a factory that allows you to produce more more cheaply and just operating the factory somewhere else that allows you to produce more more cheaply and and that struck me as not just intuitively wrong but but economically wrong and so when I started to, to ask well why you know the the concrete way of I think point to putting these things next to each other is to ask um, well well what actually feels differently if you're living in a community where uh, where a factory is impacted by trade as opposed to it's impacted by automation. Uh, a community that sees a factory impacted by trade in, in the most extreme sense that the factory is simply shut down and moved somewhere else obviously has a very different experience than a factory that simply installs robots. Uh, in one case, the jobs are literally gone. In the other case, the jobs are different. Uh, in one case, you see all sorts of negative spillover effects into the broader community. In the other, you would actually expect to see positive spillover effects. Either the, the jobs that are still in the community are now better, higher paying jobs. If other people who have different skills come to do those jobs, they've still moved to the community. The community is still an engine of production and, and tradable output that allows it to engage with the rest of the world. And the services economy that's operating around that factory can thrive even if there are relatively few highly productive people still doing the work in the factory. If the factory is gone, that's just not the case. Even if you love the idea of a services intensive economy, not everyone can just serve each other coffee. And so why is it that these things feel so different when we think about lived experience, and yet in formal economic terms, we might be told they're essentially exactly the same? Um, and the answer is that in, in formal economic terms, we focus only on consumer welfare. Um, from the perspective of the consumer, if we think about the people in that town as consumers, if we think about the country as consumers, we are in fact indifferent to where the products get made. 
Um, but if we take seriously people's interests as workers and say that that they matter at least as much, or I'm going to argue they actually matter more than as con than just their interest as consumers, uh, then who actually makes the stuff and where it gets made turns out to matter a lot and has to be a bigger part of our economic analysis. So the book is called The Once and Future Worker, uh, and and. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about why I think the worker focus is better, and then we'll talk a little bit about what those implications are, and ultimately why I think it's actually a very positive thing for economic development and for technology in particular. Because as the title of the talk suggests, we have a problem of throwing robots under the bus. Um, I think the, the hope for effect uh, when when economists and other policymakers have argued, well, it, it's it we don't need to worry. Robots are just like trade. Is people are going to say, oh, well, that's great. Then it's all good. Um, but I think the result is actually the opposite. People are saying, oh, well, then it's all bad, and we need to start taxing robots and being scared of technology as well. Uh, and that's not right. Technology should be workers' best friend. Uh, technology automation is the mechanism by which we make every worker more productive. We uh, increase prosperity. We allow wages to rise over time. And so we need a model that's going to allow us to distinguish forms of economic development that might be negatively disruptive and might harm our interests as workers, and developments that are actually very positive, especially on the technological front, that are going to be especially beneficial to our interests as workers. All right, so why work? Why why talk about worker interests instead of consumer welfare? Um, the, the standard way we talk about economic policy and our goal as uh, policymakers today is with the metaphor of the economic pie. Uh, this metaphor has been around since roughly the 1950s. Virtually every president has used it, Republican and Democrat. The Wall Street Journal and New York Times editorial boards use it. You can find left of center, right of center think tanks using it. Everyone thinks this is a great way to talk about the economy. And the premise is that if you think of the economy as a pie, then instead of fighting over who gets a bigger slice, we should think of it as something that we can make bigger. And if the pie gets bigger, everyone can have a bigger slice. Uh, and that's certainly true as far as it goes. And it's worth noting that a taking this approach, we have succeeded on its terms. So we have made the pie massively bigger. Everyone does have a larger slice, either directly or via redistribution. And yet not everybody is especially happy with the outcome. And I think the reason for that is because pie is wonderful, pie is delicious, um, but pie isn't what life is about. Um, what it misses, to stretch the metaphor too far, is the question of who bakes the pie. Uh, at the extreme, if you took economic pie seriously, you'd say, well, it's actually really fine if just a few people produce essentially all the wealth for society and we mail checks to everybody else. This is kind of the universal basic income model. Um, and, and the reality is that that is not going to work for people. And the reason it's not going to work for people is that people actually care very deeply about their identities as producers, as workers who are making productive contributions to their communities, who are fulfilling their own obligations, who are supporting themselves and their own families. And we can see this on a whole bunch of dimensions. So first of all, work is incredibly important to individuals. Okay, Having a productive occupation, whether it's a vocation, whether it's being productive within your own household, is critically important to self-esteem. It's critically important to mental health. It's critically important to happiness. And I tend to be somewhat skeptical of, of happiness studies. They get a little squishy. But the very good ones look at the same person over time. So you have a baseline. You ask people constantly for long periods of time, how are you feeling about your life? And one very interesting insight from those studies is that people just sort of have a default level of happiness. Some of us are happier than others, and what happens in life isn't going to change that very much. Um, the second fascinating insight is that we get used to almost anything. So births, deaths, marriages, divorces, even permanent disabilities will produce blips up and down in how we're feeling about life, but we almost always get used to it and return to our pre-existing level. The only exception to that in the literature is unemployment. People do not get used to not having work. They move to a permanently lower level of life satisfaction. And finally, in economic terms, work is incredibly important to people's own opportunities. If people don't have work, if people are not engaged in productive activity that's actually allowing them to develop skills, to engage in the economy, to move up over time, they have no prospect of progress. You can maintain someone in poverty very well through redistribution, but you are not going to create that first step onto the economic ladder that is a prerequisite to the second step. So work is incredibly important to individuals. It's equally important to family and community. Um, work, having a job, uh, and especially for men, is incredibly important to family formation, 
Uh, and you would think of that philosophically for both the economic and social rationales for marriage, but also in practice it turns out that work has a huge effect on men's uh, Men's work has a huge effect on family formation. It also has a huge effect on family stability. Again, for men, unemployment is a, a huge predictor of divorce, much larger in scale than the typical effects that you see for other things in social science research. And work is critically important for children. Children have better outcomes in families where they have parents who are working. And even more broadly, children have better outcomes just in communities where people are working. Put your own parents aside. Growing up in a community where the adults are working uh, has a tremendous effect on the opportunity that all of those children are going to have as they grow up. And if you think about community generally, work for one thing is a nexus of community, especially in more rural areas. Work is where people come together and engage and use as a nexus uh, for building social capital. Work is also incredibly important to building other community assets, to investing in public goods, to maintaining homes and neighborhoods. Um, and conversely, when you don't have work, you get more crime, you get more addiction, you get all the kind of uh, destructive behaviors that, that destroy communities. And then I think the last thing in, in much more straightforward economic terms, and this comes back uh, to, to this point we were making about tradables and, and whether we care if there's a factory in the community, every community needs to be able to make something that the rest of the world wants. Um, our, our strange obsession with manufacturing isn't just archaic or quirky. Uh, there are ways to make things the rest of the world want besides manufacturing, but manufacturing is an awfully good one. And if you don't have anything the rest of the world wants, you need to wonder how you're going to get everything you want from the rest of the world, the medicines, the cars, the electricity, the computers, and so on and so forth. And what we find in communities that don't have anything the rest of the world wants is that they literally export need. That the transfer payments from the government to the people on government benefit programs in a community are literally the way that you generate the ability to capture resources from the rest of the of the country. And so you think of in a, in a really depressed community in the dilapidated shopping plaza, you'll see a sparkling occupational therapy office. That business is literally the exporter for that community, exporting to the country their care of the people on disability in the community. You find under Obama, the USDA literally promoted food stamp enrollment as good for local economic activity because of the great multiplier effect it was going to have when you spent your food stamps at the local grocery store. Um, that is a model of economic uh, development and, and community vitality. I would argue it's a, a really, really bad one. And so if you believe that work matters, then you can't be indifferent to the form that economic growth takes. You have to actually care that the economic growth is coming in a form that is going to remain inclusive, as it's going to allow particularly less skilled people to still find jobs that are going to give them the opportunity to support their families and communities. And you have to have a bias in your public policy that says that the policies we're going to pursue are not just whichever ones produce the most growth, but ones that produce the right kind of growth. Um, there's a lot of policy implications about that that we can talk about some more. I'll mention them very briefly and then want to talk a little bit about, about technology and how we should think about that, the effect of that. Um, so if you care about work outcomes, what does that mean in practice? It means you want to focus on the labor market. Um, particularly folks who are committed to free markets will tend to say, well, per se, wherever the market lands is the efficient outcome. That's the whole point of the market. And that's fine as far as it goes. It breaks down if the efficient outcome is not always the best one. And what I mean by that is that in the labor market, the efficient market might the efficient outcome might be one that we don't consider is socially acceptable. There's nothing in economics that says that the efficient outcome in the labor market is going to be one where people of all skill levels in all places are going to be able to find good work that supports their families and communities. And so if we have a bias that we actually want that, then we have to be prepared to say we're not just going to accept what the market gives us. We're going to say we need to have an effect on that. And the way to do that isn't to order the market around. It's not to say we don't like this, so we order you to do something differently and we're going to shame businesses until they comply. You you typically just get worse outcomes, but it's to look at the conditions that the marketing is op the market is operating in. Uh, a market is just a neutral processing mechanism that responds to the conditions it sees and spits out an answer. And so if we don't like the answer, we have to ask, why are the conditions producing that? And so that's things like the regulatory environment. Why is it that the most attractive ways to deploy capital in our economy are focused heavily on 
non-labor intensive, especially non-unskilled labor intensive uh, pursuits in areas like finance and technology, and investing in the actual physical economy and making things with less skilled people turn out to be something that's relatively less attractive. That's within our ability to change as policymakers. We have to look from the supply side of the labor market at how we're preparing people to work. Right now, we've essentially said we're going to push as many people as possible through college because those who achieve the college degree are the most productive, highest earners who drive our innovation and growth. And if you don't make it, if you drop out somewhere along the way, we don't really have much for you. Most people in this country still do not earn even a community college degree. And that's after 40 years of intensive investment, doubling per pupil spending, now spending more than $100 billion a year subsidizing higher education. Uh, we can take a different approach and say we absolutely encourage and support folks who want to pursue college, but they're actually going to capture the return of that in their higher earnings over life. And if they don't, they probably shouldn't be pursuing it. And who we owe the most support to, and at least as strong a track, uh, beginning in high school for is the people who aren't going to be college graduates. How do we engage them in the workforce sooner, connect them with employers, take the money we're spending on subsidizing college and instead subsidize initial jobs that are going to get people into the workforce. All of this has a huge implication for trade and immigration. Again, for the consumer welfare perspective, it doesn't matter who makes the stuff or where they make it, the cheaper the better. From the worker welfare perspective, who gets to compete in the labor market actually matters a great deal. And that doesn't matter, mean that trade is bad. I think trade is great, and I think we should want as much trade as we can possibly have, but we actually have to insist that it's balanced trade. We actually have to have a view that trade deficits matter, that if we get into a situation where we are buying a tremendous amount of stuff from the world, but what we are sending in return isn't stuff that we made, it's IOUs, it's treasury bills that literally just say, we will pay you for this sometime later, or it's our assets and our real estate and our equity, uh, that's not an acceptable trade. That works great for consumers, it doesn't work for workers. And then finally, I think we should look inside the labor market and look at something like organized labor and recognize that we should want to have a system of organized labor. We should want workers to be able to organize, to provide for each other's mutual aid, and to be able to bargain collectively with employers. What we don't want is the system we have now, which is badly broken and which neither employers nor workers like. Uh, we need a system that actually encourages the two sides to collaborate and to find agreements for themselves that they actually prefer to what we would impose on them as policymakers. And then lastly, I think we need a wage subsidy. If you want more of something, you can subsidize it. If we want more low-wage jobs, we want more money in those paychecks at the end of the day, we can create a program that says if you're a low-wage worker, just like you have that FICA line that we take money out of your paycheck for payroll taxes, we can have a work credit line that puts money in. And that's going to make those jobs more attractive for less skilled workers to get them into the market. It's going to make the creation of those jobs more attractive to employers to encourage that kind of investment. And it's going to make those jobs one that actually allow people to support themselves and their families. Um, so that's a lot of policy. The, the last thing I want to talk about briefly, and this now returns to the technology question, is how do we think about technology and automation and the future of robots and the workforce? One problem with everything I'm saying is that if robots are going to destroy all the jobs, we're kind of stuck. Um, and so I think it's important to realize that that's not going to happen. Um, and we know that that's not going to happen from three perspectives. First of all, we know that it's not going to happen because it never has happened. Okay, the technological breakthroughs that we're anticipating and that we're seeing around us are really interesting and impressive. But there's no reason to believe that they are more interesting and impressive than democratic capitalism or electricity or computers or the internet. These kinds of innovations come through over time and certainly they cause disruption. But in every case, the end result has been higher productivity and more jobs. So that's one reason to be optimistic. The second reason to be optimistic is that if we look at what's happening right now at this moment that we're supposedly facing so much disruption, we're actually seeing the opposite. And ITIF, I think, has done the best work on this, showing that actually productivity gains are lower than they've ever been. Job churn is lower than it's ever been. Uh, what we are actually lacking right now is deployment of technology in the market. And we should want more of it. And that we don't have it is part of the explanation for why we're seeing bad outcomes for workers. And then finally, looking ahead, I think it's important to recognize that most of the studies that say that robots are going to take the jobs make the fatal error of treating technology and labor as direct substitutes. They look at each type of job and say, which of these could a machine do? And the worst studies, and unfortunately a lot of times the most prominent ones, like the infamous, infamous Oxford study that say robots are going to take 50% of the jobs, they just look at a job like school bus driver, 
and they say, well, gosh, that would be an easy thing to automate because it's just driving on the same route every day. And on days like today, you don't even have to drive because it's maybe sleeting a tiny little bit. Um, school bus driver is the last job that will ever be automated in our society. And anyone who puts a kindergartner on the bus every day knows that. Okay, defining a job and saying, well, that feels like a job a machine could do is not the right way to think about it because every job includes a number of different tasks. School bus driver is not just about guiding the bus. It's also about being responsible for all the kids in the metal box for the half hour. And as you actually think about jobs in those terms, the actual tasks associated with the job, what you find is that most jobs have a whole bunch of tasks that machines can do and also a whole bunch that machines can't do. And that's what has always happened. And as far as we can tell, that's always what is going to happen. The number of jobs you can actually just replace or have ever just been replaced is vanishingly small. Toll taker is the best one I've heard. If you have other examples, I'd actually like to hear them. But they're actually very hard to think of. And so what we should expect will happen over time as we deploy the technology that we want to deploy is that more and more of these jobs can become more productive as you do more with less of your time because the machine is helping you. And the reason that that's such an optimistic story at the end of the day, uh, but also one that's a real challenge for us to think about as policymakers uh, and for businesses to think about, is it means that we're constrained by the workers that we have. So this is my last point, that we have this idea that all of these unskilled workers are out of luck because these technologies are going to require more and different skills, and so someone else is going to do those jobs. There is no imaginary pool of other highly skilled people sitting out there unemployed to come and do the jobs. And when you hear people lament the so-called skills gap and say, oh, there are 800,000 advanced manufacturing jobs and no one to fill them, and this is a market failure, it's not a market failure. It's a market signal. The idea of a skills gap is actually ludicrous. There's actually an infinity skills gap. I would gladly employ infinity people if there were Harvard graduates willing to work for $5 a month doing whatever I ask them, right? Like, there's unlimited capacity to employ people in that way, uh, but the fact that I can't find them isn't a signal that the market is failing. It's a signal that my business idea really stinks. And so the way we need to think about this is that actually the people we have in our economy and again, this depends on how you draw the borders around your labor market, are the people who are going to have to do the work. They are going to be the constraint on how well we can deploy the automation. And if we force employers and capital to work with the workers that we have and say your path to making this work is to make your technology work with the workers, that's ultimately going to be to everybody's benefit. And so that's why we should stop throwing robots under the bus admit that robots are very different from other forms of economic development, and celebrate one while also recognizing that we need to change how we think about some of the others. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Ori. <clears throat> so um, if you haven't seen that Oxford study, um, you don't need to. Um, <laughs> but the one I like about the Oxford study, the other occupation is my favorite, is that they predict that all fashion models will be eliminated. <clears throat> Uh, and you can imagine Versace putting down, you know, three thousand dollar dresses on a robot going down the runway. I, I, I just don't envision that happening. You could just drape it right over Jim. Yeah, we could just put it on you, <laughs> Jim. That's a very attractive suit that your robot is wearing. Yeah. Uh, Brink. Uh, thanks, Rob, uh, for uh, including me in this event. Thanks, Oren, for writing a uh, uh, extremely intelligent, extremely stimulating book. Uh, there's lots of moving parts in it, uh, and therefore lots to talk about. But I'm gonna. I confine myself to three basic reactions. Uh, first, uh, expressing uh, profound agreement with the big picture and main thrust of the book's argument. Uh, second, quibbling a bit with the book's framing, how Oren uh, sets up and showcases his argument. Uh, and third, straight up dissenting uh, from one line of analysis uh, that, uh, that uh, Oren puts a fair amount of weight on uh, throughout the book. So first, big picture, uh, profound agreement on uh, <clears throat> stressing the uh, importance of work, uh, the social value of work, the fact that the uh, social returns to work are in excess of the private returns to work, and therefore if we look only at, at uh, these matters uh, 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 through the narrow lens of private returns, we miss uh, some of the social value of work. Uh, <clears throat> the focus on worker welfare, uh, and not just material. Uh, there is a, a tendency to reduce everything to incomes, uh, uh, but uh, we're 
uh, we're more than consumers, we're producers, we have producer interests, uh, and our interests as producers extend beyond income to things like status, uh, meaning of work, uh, and self-respect, uh, and when we ignore those, uh, we do so at our peril. Um, uh, furthermore, I want to express uh, profound agreement with the uh, the break that Oren makes with uh, with current right of center orthodoxy, uh, which is basically to reduce uh, all uh, economic stewardship to cutting uh, the top individual tax rates as low as possible uh, and cutting social spending as much as possible uh, to pay for said tax cuts. Uh, Oren sees the need for affirmative, active uh, government measures uh, to address uh, labor market problems, uh, and I agree with him. In particular, uh, the two biggest uh, labor market reforms uh, that he suggests a big move uh, towards more vocational education uh, and apprenticeship on the one hand uh, and a big program of wage subsidies on the other uh, are both ideas that I think are uh, incredibly important. I agree with the need for them uh, very much and so I salute Oren for making a strong case uh, for moving policy in this direction. <clears throat> okay, uh, so now to quibble. Um, uh, the, Oren sets up his book uh, with good guys and bad guys. Uh, the good guys uh, are the uh, champions uh, led by Oren of productive pluralism. Uh, the bad guys are the proponents of economic piety. Uh, economic piety is defined as a function just on, on uh, GDP growth and on incomes. Uh, and in particular, uh, an idea that any problems uh, with uh, the uh, labor market can be dealt with uh, on the front end by, uh, by upgrading skills and on the back end uh, by transfer payments. Um, so uh, what's my problem with this framing? I'm, uh, I think, pretty much of a poster boy for economic piety. I've written a lot about uh, the uh, slowdown in GDP growth and what to do about it. Uh, I work at a think tank whose uh, sort of signature policy vision is that of a free market welfare state, which is to uh, let uh, the engines of economic dynamism uh, run unimpeded and uh, uh, take care of, uh, of the problems that ensue uh, through, uh, through social spending. Um, but uh, uh, if, if I'm uh, the poster child for the bad guys, then why do I uh, have uh, such strong agreement with what I take to be the central thrust of the book? Uh, that suggests to me that maybe the framing is a little off and that, uh, and that, uh, that being uh, in the economic piety camp doesn't doom you to be benighted uh, on recognizing the really important points that, uh, uh, that uh, Oren wants to make. Uh, furthermore, uh, the, uh, the idea that to diss the economic pietists as wanting to uh, solve all labor market problems with either upgrading skills or with transfer payments uh, is curious in light of the fact that uh, the two biggest labor market reforms that uh, that Oren suggests are to upgrade skills <laughs> through a big program of vocational education and apprenticeship and a big program of transfer payments uh, through wage subsidies. So uh, the how of, of, uh, of upgrading skills and redistributing is different from the status quo, and, uh, and I agree that the how matters a lot. Uh, but again, uh, there's sort of uh, less difference between the e some economic pietists and some productive pluralists uh, than might, might meet the eye. Uh, but that's okay. I'm, I'm not really deeply concerned about, uh, about the framing issues because what is framing? Framing is packaging. Uh, packaging is persuasion. Uh, if I frame uh, my support for, uh, for a big move towards vocational education and wage subsidies one way, uh, that may be persuasive to one audience or in frames them another way. They may be persuasive to another audience. We agree on the bottom line and that's what's really important. Uh, so uh, I take these framing issues as, as not uh, essential matters for disagreement. Uh, a matter that I do uh, disagree just squarely on, uh, though, is uh, Oren's contention that what has gone wrong uh, doesn't really reflect deep structural forces in the economy, it's just bad thinking, that we just uh, got, gotten under the illusion of this sort of excessive materialist uh, um, uh, incomes focus, um, and that uh, important deep changes in the way the world is working aren't really driving uh, our problems. Uh, so uh, the uh, dramatic loss in manufacturing employment uh, 
uh, just reflects sort of benighted policy, uh, not anything necessary about the way the world has changed. Um, and that, I think, is just simply wrong. Uh, the, uh, the issue isn't that we, uh, uh, that we have now shifted uh, production of the stuff that we consume uh, overseas uh, to a much greater extent. The problem is we just consume relatively less stuff uh, that is relative to non-material consumption than we used to. So if you look at personal consumption expenditures that uh, the government uses for weighting of, of uh, consumer price index uh, in 1947 through 1949, uh, commodities uh, comprise 73% of consumption, services 27%, uh, uh, whereas in uh, 2012 it was 40% for commodities and 60% for services. So there has been a steady ongoing dematerialization of consumption away from stuff uh, and towards services and experiences. Uh, this is even more dramatic if you look at it in the broader sweep. Um, Robert Fogel, the great economic historian, uh, looked at it in a larger time series and also uh, imp imputing uh, or including in consumption uh, leisure uh, where workers will uh, effectively buy leisure with shorter working hours uh, as one of the things that they consume. If you look at things this way, uh, according to Fogel, in 1875, food, clothing, and shelter comprised 74% of consumption. In 1995, they comprised only 13, uh, while leisure has gone from 18% of consumption to 68%. Uh, so uh, this is... Uh, this is a uh, dramatic narrowing of the relative importance of consuming stuff in our lives, uh, and uh, I think this is just an irresistible uh, fact of, uh, of economic development that makes uh, a focus on manufacturing uh, not irrelevant, not hopeless, uh, but hard and swimming against the tide. Uh, furthermore, um, I think it's not just a kind of quantitative ongoing shift that we are experiencing, uh, but there is an important qualitative shift that happened about the time uh, of 40 years ago or so uh, where Oren starts to see things going wrong. And this qualitative shift is a discon... <coughs> uh, the, so the capitalist wealth explosion of the past 200 years uh, was born in conditions of uh, acute dependence of technological progress on big inputs of brute physical labor and tedious clerical labor. Uh, and that dependence of technological progress and the capitalist dynamic system on lots of ordinary workers uh, was the fault line uh, of, uh, of social life, the, uh, the fault line of class conflict. Uh, it was uh, an enormously contentious uh, division. Uh, we are now living through the mirror image uh, uh, problems, which is the disconnect uh, between technological progress and big inputs of, of uh, ru uh, routine, uh, less skilled labor. Um, and uh, uh, that, uh, that means that the status of sort of less skilled ordinary work has undergone a, uh, a one-time irreversible decline. Uh, once upon a time, the whole system, uh, uh, the key industries, American economic might, and therefore American and global security, all depended upon the input of, of blue-collar workers. It just doesn't anymore. Uh, the system can run fine. Uh, technological progress can continue with inputs from smaller and smaller uh, fraction of the workforce, uh, and that uh, means that the status of less skilled work is just less important than it used to be. Uh, and that is a hill that we have to climb uh, when dealing with, uh, with how to structure policy. Uh, finally, uh, there is just an ongoing uh, logic of capitalist development that Capitalist progress means making life easier and easier for consumers by making life harder and harder for producers. Uh, that is, producers have to continually up their productivity uh, over time to stay competitive or they fall out. Uh, so this works fine for businesses, but uh, people are both uh, consumers and producers of labor, uh, and it is getting harder and harder over the the requirements for being a successful contributor uh, to uh, economic production have gone up over time. The median worker used to have a, uh, be a high school dropout. 
Uh, now it's somebody with some college. Uh, so to get to the middle of the labor pack now is a lot harder than it used to be. Uh, and so the uh, a reliance purely on, uh, on market rewards uh, for work over time, given this problem, is going to mean a lot more people over time are marginalized, which is what we have been experiencing. So policy will have to push back against that affirmatively, uh, but again, it is pushing against the tide. Here again, uh, I'm, I'm okay with this difference uh, if, uh, if the, the basic problem is to underestimate how difficult the challenges are, uh, but uh, sort of self-delusion is an important uh, first step often in constructive uh, problem solving. If you actually know how hard the problem is, maybe you won't even uh, try to solve it. Uh, so again, I'm okay uh, with this difference, and it doesn't detract from uh, what I consider to be the book's uh, considerable virtues and the wisdom and correctness of its central thrust. Great. Thank you, Brink. Um, or I think we maybe yeah, wait until everybody yeah, definitely. you can respond to everybody. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Rob. Appreciate the uh, chance to participate on this uh, panel. So I agree with uh, Oren on the importance of putting workers at the center of public policy, because for at least the last 40 years, uh, that has uh, definitely not been the case. Uh, America's pursued a, a large number of tax, social, and labor policies that have been quite destructive of workers. And I think that's one of the reasons for the stagnant wages and the decline of opportunity uh, for the middle class that uh, Oren, I think, very effectively uh, documents. But the problem I have with the book is its partisan symmetry in diagnosing uh, this uh, problem, because he basically argues that both parties are to blame and that neither has really done uh, much to help uh, workers. And I would disagree with uh, that argument. I think if you look at tax policies, uh, Republican tax cuts for the wealthy have been the preeminent uh, uh, tax uh, policy uh, over uh, the last several uh, decades. Uh, this has created great harm uh, for the middle class and the average uh, workers. Uh, Republicans have poked holes in the social uh, safety net. So. In my book on the future of work, I propose a number of policies that I think uh, would help the average uh, worker. Uh, and these are things like uh, uh, paid family and medical leave, investing in education, improving job retraining uh, programs, enacting tax policies uh, that actually build a more inclusive America. I mean, I think we need to get uh, much more serious about income inequality because it is a huge uh, barrier to our current situation as well as the future plight of workers. So in my view, uh, these are the things uh, that would uh, make a, a difference. Warren also makes several points about Trump being correct in highlighting the need to improve the plight of average uh, workers. Uh, and he suggests that we need to think uh, free trade practices and globalization as our primary economic strategy, uh, that we need to uh, place less emphasis on some of the uh, uh, environmental uh, rules and, uh, and regulations, and that we need to really get back to uh, focusing on uh, workers. And in this regard, I guess I would distinguish between candidate Trump versus President uh, Trump, because I actually think candidate Trump was correct in saying average uh, folks have uh, gotten a raw deal and that in a number of respects the system is rigged against them. And if he had actually followed up with policies uh, that addressed uh, those issues, I would be uh, more sympathetic uh, towards him. But President Trump's policies have merely reinforced existing uh, inequities. You know, like what we've seen in, in a number of past administrations, his tax cut went mostly, mostly to wealthy individuals and corporations. He hasn't really uh, invested uh, in education. I mean, many of the things he's done has uh, harmed uh, the average uh, worker. So I don't think his policies are going to be the answer. I want to close with a comment on the uh, technology impact on the workforce. And I actually agree with Oren that a lot of the job concerns uh, here that we read frequently about in the newspapers, uh, that those concerns are overblown. Uh, I certainly don't think half of jobs are going to disappear uh, based on automation. But I also don't believe the impact is going to be zero. Because the issue is there are actually two different revolutions taking place simultaneously uh, right now. Uh, one is the technology revolution, which I think all of us on this panel has uh, written about, you know, the rise of AI, the development of uh, robotics, uh, developments in uh, e-commerce, uh, automation in general. But then the second revolution, 
that is also taking place is changes in business models, which basically involve the switch away from full-time jobs with benefits to temporary workers, part-time jobs, independent contractors, often with no benefits attached to them or limited uh, uh, benefits. So sometimes I think in this whole debate over automation, we focus too much on the job impact, but not enough on the possible impact on incomes and uh, benefits. I mean, there have actually been studies of, of British workers early in the Industrial Revolution uh, that have documented that it took uh, you know, 40 to 50 years for the average worker to actually, you know, for wages to stop stagnating uh, and uh, to start to uh, grow again. So there may not be so much of a job impact from past technologies as well as current technologies, but I think there could be income uh, 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 consequences, and there's certainly already uh, we're seeing benefit uh, uh, impacts uh, just uh, because of the changes in the uh, business uh, models. I think the U.S. Uh, faces some particular risks right now because we have a weak social safety net and incredibly poor uh, governance. We also have huge geographic disparities in our economic activity. Uh, most of our economic t activity today is uh, taking place on the East Coast and the West Coast and a few uh, metropolitan areas uh, in between. Uh, I had some uh, colleagues at Brookings in our metro program who did an analysis and they found uh, something like 15% of American counties generate 64% of our GDP. This is a recipe for Trumpism outlasting Trump himself. The sense of anxiety that he very effectively identified during the campaign among the general public is likely to accelerate. Uh, other countries, I think, are probably going to have a smoother transition to the digital economy just because their policies are more attuned to helping workers adjust to the digital economy. So uh, basically, I think the governance problems are going to matter a lot as the United States uh, grapples with these issues. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, Jim. I'm assuming everybody can hear me? Yep. Yep. Perfectly. Oh, I, I still don't believe this technology is working. Um, I'm assuming I'm speaking into the void, but I'll, uh, uh, I'll, t I'll take your word for it. Um, uh, I very much like the idea of, uh, of thinking about workers and putting work uh, at the center of any sort of economic policy agenda going forward. Um, this now seems like a decades ago, uh, but it was only like three years ago. On the right, there was uh, this sort of Reformacon movement, uh, which Orrin was a part of, uh, which focused on a rethinking of what sort of the center-right economic agenda uh, should be. Uh, it very much disagreed with the idea that everywhere and always a rising tide would lift all boats, that guess what, sometimes uh, all the boats don't rise, and certainly you have a case uh, where some boats rise a lot faster than others, and perhaps uh, those, those other boats that are rising more slowly, we could do something about that. Uh, and uh, we put together, and we, myself, other, other folks, uh, you know, put out some ideas uh, out there, some of which I think are reflected in Oren's work, uh, such as the idea of uh, either an expanded earned income tax credit or even a much broader uh, earnings or wage subsidy. Uh, another part of that agenda was focusing on education and the idea that not everybody uh, should necessarily be going to a traditional four-year brick-and-mortar college, that there were other ways, there should be at least other ways to the middle class uh, that did not involve that way. And that, that That's not for everybody and uh, given the, the demands of the economy, that really wasn't a great way to meet sort of the labor uh, demands of the economy. So, to the extent uh, you know, all that stuff is in is uh, sort of you know in the in the bones of the book. Uh, that's great, man. I, I, I love that stuff. Um, uh, uh, the stuff I sort of like less is sort of the. Um, uh, sort of the populist agenda sort of glommed on, I think, to all those other ideas, um, uh, where I think sort of the, uh, the evidence is not particularly strong, even if that sort of is, you know, kind of what the spirit of the age is uh, at the moment. Um, uh, it always sort of leads off with talking about, the, you know, his economic pie example. Um, 
which I, I which I think is sort of odd given uh, given the economy. One of the biggest challenge to the American economy over the past decade has been has been very slow growth and a very slow recovery. And then even uh, before the Great Recession, the econ- the the, uh, the challenge was we had this downshift in productivity growth. And uh, you know maybe I maybe I believe in economic piety, but still the main thing that will drive living standards and worker earnings is good productivity growth. Uh, so we need to have policies that focus on improving productivity growth. And uh, and I, I just don't, I don't think we have the luxury at this point in picking, as if we had such ample growth and such massive productivity that we can be in sort of picking and choosing uh, what kinds of growth we have. Uh, I think, I think, I think growth needs to be at the forefront uh, of sort of every uh, economic policy. If we don't have that, listen, uh, the Fed, I think the Fed's long-term forecast for growth is like 1.8%. That's about half of what we've had since World War II. Uh, It will not be a pro-worker policy if we put in place policies that don't even give us 1.8% growth, that we have perhaps, uh, you know, know, 1% growth or or, or less. And and perhaps that, you know, being not distributed... um, yeah, that's distributed even less equally. Um, I'm trying to think about like where where is the model for this sort of agenda um, where they're getting a better outcome, where you sort of have a less dynamic economy because you're not actually you're not really working worried so much about workers, um, which would be a, which is great. It seems to me that a lot of Orrin's sort of you know revised agenda is really about jobs, putting a putting the job rather than the worker at the center. Of the agenda, and you saw that very much with the, with the president when he was attacking, uh, you know, carrier moving these, you know, moving workers around. But when he focuses on the job, the jobs shouldn't shouldn't change, and that's very much what I heard, or I continue to hear from the left when they attack, you know, Walmart or Amazon. That these are dis- that these are disruptive companies that these that disrupt jobs. Uh, and I can very easily see where a lot of Orrin's book would be would be well, indeed it has been well embraced by folks on the left, who uh, who, who don't particularly like you know, the disruption that's necessary for a strong economy, uh, the kind of folks who've been attacking Walmart and now attack Amazon, and I can very easily see um, a lot of the a lot of these arguments uh, being used by people who don't particularly like disruption, uh, who who don't particularly uh, are particularly uh, you know you know pro market kinds of folks. And which is why I, 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 I'm glad or does address sort of the automation issue, because I would be very concerned that the exact same arguments um, uh, where you are arguing against, you know, trade, arguing against immigration would be used uh, by folks who maybe would like to uh, would like to, uh, you know, ban ATMs or ban kiosks or, or, or uh, put robot taxes. And even though I think you try to make that separation, uh, I don't think it's a huge leap that if what we're focusing on is not taking care of the worker, uh, whether that's through training or retraining or relocation subsidies uh, or expanded safety net, if what you're doing is focusing on the job, then it's very easy to make the argument that we must preserve the job uh, even if the result is slower economic growth, which, by the way, has been very hard uh, to generate in recent years. So again, uh, I think you're. I think you're trying to make the argument that we that that leap shouldn't be made. I think it'll be awfully tempting uh, uh, to make that leap, and that, and that that is a huge concern of mine uh, with this book. And I and I think um, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I think it's also a little odd to be focusing to say we must take the focus off consumption. At the same time, we're proposing a two hundred billion dollar a year. Uh, expanded wage subsidy. Now we can try to rebrand that as as bringing people into work. So it's it's really kind of a a, a work subsidy. But what you're also doing is increasing people's ability to consume. And if you believe that part of this so-called economic anxiety is, is is a consumption anxiety, well, yeah, then we should be focusing on consumption. Indeed, one way to do it uh, is to raise people's living standards. Uh, giving them a subsidy so they can consume more. And indeed, we're focusing on the working class here. But of course, if we let them consume more, then we've, we've turned the working class uh, into the middle class. I don't think we should try to hide that fact that what we're doing is redistributing so people can consume more just because the branding on that sort of does it. We're kind of obscuring what we are doing. 
uh, because the branding doesn't work. So we're trying to rebrand it as something as something else. And what it what it, what it is is yes, um, uh, these sorts of subsidies will hopefully draw people in the labor market. Though you sort of you know, have pretty pretty good labor market right now under the current policies. Uh, but what we're really doing is redistributing, and and to pretend like we won't be doing a lot more of that in the future. Um, listen, you. We, we don't have to think robots will take all the jobs. But we can't think that we, we will have an altered labor market. And even people have looked at this, like uh, Daron Asamolu has said, listen, the jobs aren't all going away, but we very well may have a situation where we'll have somewhat higher unemployment or maybe less labor force participation uh, than we would otherwise. And I think, you know, speaking as someone on the right, we need to be ready for that. And we need to be talking about that, that it's not wrong to redistrib redistribute to, e to people who can't work uh, unable to find a job, or perhaps the jobs don't create the sort of living standards that we as a society would want. I don't think we should obscure that fact because I, th I think I think sort of the packaging is important. That we that if we, that if you sort of think about it wrong, uh, that I think that leads to then you know more problems down the line where then you have to sort of re-educate people. Oh yeah, here's what we're actually doing. And I think so. I think we shouldn't be afraid of the phrase uh, redistribution, and nor should we be uh, afraid of the phrase creative destruction. That's what that's the secret sauce to the American economy. Uh, we, we need more of it. Uh, rather than thinking we live in this unbelievably hectic pell-mell economy, we need more destruction. We, we, we need more businesses started. We need businesses that can't make it to go out of business. There should be more companies coming in and out of the S&P 500. Um, what I fear is uh, is focusing on the job, which is really this is really a job hypothesis book, not a worker hypothesis book. That would lead to a lot more stagnation. And if I had to choose between uh, uh, France uh, and Denmark, uh, I'm going to go with Denmark, which at least they have. I may not agree with everything they do, but at least they have a, a dynamic labor market. They're open to trade, uh, immigration, and uh, I mean, I think that's a that's a much better path forward. So uh, some parts of Warren's book uh, I like quite a bit. Uh, others part, uh, other parts less so. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, Warren, before you respond, I, I got to jump in, too. Uh, Please do. <laughs> um, I've run out of room on my notebook, but I'll <laughs> There you go. Uh, before I do that, I should just say a couple of things. Uh, uh, Brink, you know, to be fair, the, this notion that we're consuming less goods, that's in nominal terms. And when you, when you do it in, in quantity-adjusted terms, it's a much different picture. But relative. That's uh, even that, I don't. I don't. We we just disagree. I mean, I think when you look at quantity adjusted uh, manufacturing uh, uh, consumption in the U.S. It's, uh, as a share, it's pretty much the same as it was 30 years ago. But just just a point of disagreement. We can talk about it later, maybe. And then, uh, Daryl, my my main sort of. Uh, if I ever hear again the Industrial Revolution took 50 years to get wages up, I do, uh, I'm going to cry, I think, because uh, I'm probably one of the few people that's actually looked at productivity growth rates uh, for the first 50 years of the Industrial Revolution, and they were minuscule. It wasn't until 1820 that they actually translated into productivity growth that was substantial, and that is exactly the time when wage growth went up. So this notion that there was this 50-year lag and workers were immiserated, it just, it's not really what the data show. Anyway, Warren, um, I re as I said before, I really like a lot of the focus of the book. Um, one point that no one mentioned, which I really liked, was this notion. This is about sort of shifting from consumers to producers, producers being individuals, but also firms. And you rightly uh, talk in there about uh, maybe we should be investing as much as we do in NIH into manufacturing innovation, which certainly music to our ears, because we've long argued that. So I think that's an important point, that we, we can and should be doing more you know, without picking particular winners, but but supporting an industrial ecosystem of innovation. So I really like that. My two points, though. One is, um, I think there's a tension in in not just what you're saying, but what everybody's saying about this, and then sort of the bottom third of the labor market. There's, there's two ways that firms raise productivity. That, they, that productivity goes up. There's two ways. There's within firms, and then between firms and industries. And so, you can get a firm like a little dry cleaner to raise productivity, or you can just have them wiped out. Sort of, sort of to Jim's point about by some more efficient dry cleaning firm. And I think that's true at, at, at bad jobs, if you will. And, and I think one of the things we don't talk about enough, um, we did an analysis for the G7 where we looked at the Oxford data, but also our own data set. And much why well, I don't like the Oxford data, I think it's too big. It, it generally sort of gets the, you know, that lawyers will be less impacted than cashiers. That's right. So when you look at that, what you find is that there's a pretty strong negative correlation uh, up around 0.6, which is very high, between 
skill levels and risk of job loss and education levels and risk of job loss within occupation. So low wage, low skill occupations, much more likely to be automated over the next 20 years than high wage, high skill occupations. And you can interpret that in two ways. That's bad it's because of these people, or you can interpret it as good as I do. I interpret it as mo partly good or even maybe mostly good because it means that there are just going to be fewer bad jobs. And, and, and at the end of the day, you, you're really limited on what you can do with bad jobs because they have low value added. So you can do wage subsidies or you can have more jobs go into higher value added and then you don't need to do wages. So that's what, and then just the last point. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one on the panel. I, I see what Daryl thinks on this. I actually think we should put higher minimum wage on the table. I think that's an important component. I, I don't buy the sort of hard left progressive $15 an hour, but I do think going up to 10 or 11 or something and then indexing to inflation is an important way. It helps boost productivity. It does help boost uh, worker earnings, and it doesn't have to all be wage subsidy. So. All right. Well, sure. First of all, just thank you guys for those responses. I think that was terrific and, and gives me a lot more to, to go back and think and, and work on as well. Um, I guess I'm going to try to avoid to do the, like, let me now respond to every bullet that each person has made because, well, there were too many and, and that would be incredibly boring as well. Um, so I want to I wanna pick up on, on, a, on, on a couple of key themes that, that I heard and that have struck me in discussions about the book generally. Um, one is that because when you talk in worker terms instead of consumer terms, you end up with a, a pretty eclectic and heterodox mix of policies, um, one reaction is to pick the ones of those that you like and say, well, therefore, I agree with it. Um, and you know, when I look at both sort of, of how Brink and, and Daryl talked about the issue, they both sort of said, I agree we need to focus on more workers, and then reiterated sort of those components of the agenda that they like, whether we're talking about workers or not. Um, and so you're absolutely right that what I talk about on education and wage subsidies is important, but education and wage subsidies make sense from a, from a consumer welfare lens also. I think where the rubber meets the road is when you say, okay, but if I'm actually changing my lens, I'm also acknowledging that we've gone too far in environmental protection. I'm also acknowledging that imbalanced trade isn't acceptable. I'm also acknowledging that we have to rethink organized labor. You're also talking about the kind of subsidy. You're, you're tying it more to wages as opposed to just handouts or yeah. Well, and, and so that's and, and and that's where where I think when when I hear Daryl talking and saying, um, you know, I agree it needs to be workers, but then the the criticism was incredibly safety net oriented, and I think we can have a, a really good discussion about how exactly to make our safety net work best. But the safety net isn't how you help workers. The safety net is how you help non-workers, and in fact, the effect of the safety net generally speaking, and especially at the margin, is to discourage work. Um, in economic terms, and, and frankly, I worry even more in cultural terms, that we've gotten to the point where we have built a safety net um, that, that essentially looks an awful lot like what an unskilled worker can expect to achieve in the job market. Uh, and so if, if we really take seriously the idea that, that work is what matters and elevating work and less skilled work matters, then I don't know that that's compatible with sort of hammering on the safety net as, as, the, as the most important component. And so I would say, you know, I hope one thing that is, is a strength of the book is that there are places where it says, you know, the left of center maybe has had it right, that we do need to be more attentive to these, some of these things. And there are places where it says the right of center has been right and we, you know, they, they were going the right direction. But I think if you're, you know, what I tried to do in, in the set of issues I go through is to essentially provide a set of litmus tests that says if you're actually prepared to endorse the idea that that worker welfare should be at the top, um, then then also sort of tell me which things that aren't part of your traditional agenda you're also ready, ready to start considering. So I think that's a helpful lens to assess how much of it is kind of the rhetorical everyone wants to talk about jobs versus how much is we're actually ready to, to talk about the trade-offs that might be involved. Um, the second piece I, I'll pick up on, and this goes more to Jim's comments about growth, is I'm all for economic growth. And I think Jim and I would in agree entirely that economic growth is critical, both given its obvious link to productivity uh, and just given the fact that, while I don't think material living standards is the sine qua non of, of a good life, it's certainly important. We certainly want it. Um, but I think we have to be a little bit skeptical uh, that, that we know what the formula for growth is. And you know the reason I say that is as Jim pointed out, we're in this period of, of low growth. Um, 
that's not a post-recession phenomenon necessarily. You know, one thing I do in the book is to try to sort of do the parade of horribles for the problem we're in, I try to use 2006 or 2007 as the anchor point for a lot of it. To say that things got so bad with the recession that we're now talking about it, but this is a 1975 to 2005 problem as much as a 1975 to today problem. Um, and so, so this is a problem we've had for a long time. And conversely, when you say, well, gosh, when, you know, when were, was productivity really growing, you go back to sort of the heyday, Jim asked kind of, you know, where's the model? Um, well, the, the period of time when productivity growth was really, I think, booming most uh, in, in the American economy was a time when tax rates were much higher, immigration rates were much lower, there was virtually no international trade by the standards of the 1920s or today. Um, and, you know, there was a, a much smaller to non-existent safety net. Um, the idea that what, what we currently sort of call the pro-growth agenda is actually what has aligned historically with the highest levels of growth isn't true. That doesn't prove the, the contrary, that these things are all bad and we should get rid of them all, but I, I really don't think we should have this view that um, that obviously rethinking uh, how we approach work and the labor market is bad for growth um, and that, that, that that's where the trade-off lies. And so the last thing I'll say, and, and the, one of the things that I, I think is an important implication of this emphasis on workers, is that it's a question of whether we think of economic growth as, as the kind of the means or the end. And what I mean by that is so much of, especially what I'm kind of snarkily calling economic piety, takes economic growth to be the starting point. We design policies that deliver economic growth, and when you get economic growth, you get all of these other great things that we want for our society. Um, and I don't know that that's the case, and I don't know that the story of the last 40 years of a period of economic growth leading to a lot of things we're quite unhappy with supports that story. I think it actually makes more sense to flip it and say that economic growth is actually the emergent property of a healthy society. That if you want economic growth, you don't just find a bunch of levers to pull that you say grow the economy, you actually be more attentive to, to society's actual foundations, to the quality of our families, quality of our communities, to what the person at the 25th or 30th percentile is capable of doing, not just what the per people right at the top are capable of doing, um, and that economic growth is, is what comes out of that. And that I think you can be committed to economic growth in a way that's that's also still a lot more sensitive to these other components as part and parcel of economic growth and not just sort of a nice thing that we wave at in our rhetoric but but disregard in terms of policy um, so I want to ask anybody else if they if they have any response to that and then we'll open it up for comments from you all or questions I, I do want to just uh, sort of to Jim's point about you know are, is the book supportive of productivity I, I, I was struck by one line or and you had which was, I think, a quote, uh, painting, uh, people paint productivity as the problem rather than the solution. And uh, that's what worries me about the debate, is we've, we, we, we've demonized productivity uh, in, in this sort of strange way. And, and, I, and, I, and as you point out in the book, there is nothing inherently in conflict with a, with a sort of producerist or worker focus. In fact, they're, they're really supportive of one another, provided you do the other kinds of things you need around communities and uh, yeah, families and networks and workers. So. Oh, and sorry, that reminds me of one more thing I wanted yeah. to jump in on. Um, to, to, you know, I think the other point that Jim made where we disagree in more of these framing and rhetorical perspectives, but I think is critically important, especially just so saying people who work in this space can do independent of what legislation will or will not get passed. You know, I, I, I take fully Jim's criticism and concern that if we start saying, gosh, some of these, you know, some forms of progress, some forms of economic growth um, might not always be beneficial, um, that opens the door. All of a sudden, we're having a much hazier debate um, than just holding the line. And you can worry about where that would follow. And I think that's a very fair political concern. I think the flip side of that is to recognize that if the only two options we offer are the hard free market, no more growth and dis and disruption and productivity and um, globalization is always better versus no these things are bad and hurting us. I think I think the the pro disruption side is actually going to lose, um, and that's why I, I referred in the book to this phrase throwing robots under the bus. I think economists have cornered themselves into this position of having to try to say in defense of this globalization growth intensive model. Um, they actually now blame automation. They say, don't blame our policies, blame automation. 
Um, and people will be happy to do that <laughs> if that's what we say. And that's going to be a disaster. And so while I fully acknowledge it's harder to move into the gray space and start drawing some of these distinctions, um, I think we have to do it. And it's better than preventing t presenting two stark alternatives in which the populist intuitive one is the one that, that I think is truly worst for, um, for, for the future. Right, but Oren, but you're, argu but, you know, you're <laughs> arguing, perhaps not clearly, but you're arguing that you know what we've had we, we've had too much we've had too much churn uh, in this society uh, in pursuit of growth, and that ch and there's churn being um, uh, generated uh, you know by immigration. There's churn being uh, generated. Uh, no, I, I I don't. I, and and on top of it, and so again, it's not a huge leap to say, oh gosh, I guess churn generated by automation. Well, I guess that's bad too. And what we really need is to have a society with less churn, where we, where it's sort of the conservative job guarantee, where the, you know our job guarantee is we will not subject you and your family and your community uh, to all these forces, whether but they're by trade or technology, and we will look lovingly back to the 1950s and 60s as 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 as, as, a, as a as a past that we can bring forward. It's it's a back, you know back to the future. Uh, when that clearly isn't going to happen, uh, that we had that that the 50s and 60s also led to the downshift in productivity in the 1970s, uh, which there wasn't a lot of competition, which we didn't have that, we, in which we didn't have immigration. So I think so I think it's I, I think it's a, a different story or narrative um, to, to to that that, that fundamentally is a is, is a narrative of, of of stagnation, albeit one that seems to fit in very well. Um, with sort of changing political circumstances. I, I just want to say one thing. Yeah, then we'll open yeah, it up. Yeah, please. Just, just to clarify, I don't criticize churn. I mentioned churn only once in the book, and it's in the context of referring to ITF's, ITF's work showing that churn is at an all-time low. Why are you great? And why, 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 do you, why do you try to at least subtly say, I'm, I'm a protectionist, but I'm not like the Trump kind of protectionist. I'm, I'm a different kind, but I have great problems with trade. And, and I think the, the, so the trade and immigration discussions, which I think are, are closely tied, and the, the title of the chapter is Of Borders and Balance. And the argument that I try to make about both trade and immigration is that from a labor market perspective, balance actually really matters. That the reason we care about trade is not that we have higher low levels. And as I just said, I think higher levels of trade are better. I think there are productivity benefits from it. There are scale benefits. But that imbalanced trade, trade where jobs go away, where we make less of some things here and don't make more of anything else instead is the concern. And that's why I opened with this example of the factory is still in the town, but different people are working in it or fewer people are working in it, and holding that up as a perfectly sustainable and desirable model, and contrasting it with the model where the factory is simply shut down. I, and likewise on immigration... I'm waiting, for the t I'm waiting for the tweet that when a, that when a, uh, a factory, a well-known American employer says, we, you know, thank, you know, thanks to technology, we are going to be more productive. But, but by the way, uh, we, we, we may have some fewer workers at this factory. And the president says of a very bad, uh, very bad exclamation point. This must change exclamation point. Um, and if I was looking, at, if I was someone in the administration looking to looking to justify a tweet, I think I'd have to pick up your book and talk about how bad all this, how bad creative destruction so, in society because it, because it. It, it upsets jobs. You know, let, let me open it up for, for cause people have been very patient. Or just a quick, quick commercial. We have a report coming out Monday uh, looking at international robot adoption, uh, but actually controlling for wage levels, which uh, the International Federation of Robots doesn't do. And when you do that, you find the U.S. is incredibly lagging, incredibly lagging behind uh, mostly Asian, Southeast Asian economies. More robots. But, the other key study, the other key component of that, countries that have higher robot adoption actually don't see uh, more job loss. They actually see just a teeny little uh, amount because they gain market share. So let's open it up for comments or questions. If you can wait for the mic, if anybody, uh, right, right here, um, Rachel. and then if you can just say who you are and if you have a want to direct it to anybody in particular. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ulrich Manns. I work at the uh, Netherlands Embassy here in uh, Washington, D.C. as an innovation attaché. Um, question to Oren, uh, but also to, to the rest of the panel. Um, taken from a business perspective, if you look at what's happening in the U.S., across the U.S., where would you look for good examples where factories or businesses in different sectors, not manufacturing necessarily, have been successfully starting to 
have that conversation with workers when it comes to automation and putting robotics next to workers. Uh, what are the sort of the guiding, uh, the leading examples that, that you know of that you, you'd be looking for? What kind of sectors, what kind of businesses? Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think as Rob said, if, if anything, we're lagging behind um, the, you know, it is happening. There are, rob there are robots going into factories, and when robots go into factories, they have to find ways to engage with workers. Um, actually, if I can, I want to hand this over to, to Daryl to talk a little bit more, because his book actually provides some very good case studies of how this is happening. The, the one that comes to mind is the one about how this actually safety breakthroughs and making it easier um, making sure the swinging robotic arm wasn't going to knock anybody over turned out to be the key to deploying it. Um, but that comes to mind. I don't know if you have any other thoughts that you want to add there. Uh, sure. Uh, I'll just add an example. From a couple weeks ago, I was addressing the National Restaurant Association on this uh, very topic and was surprised to discover actually how much robotics and automation is coming into that sector. Uh, like we kind of think about, you know, transportation and autonomous uh, vehicles and uh, e-commerce and kind of automated uh, retail outlets. But uh, the food industry is on the verge of a major wave of innovation taking place. And the thing that impressed me is the number of people at uh, this uh, event, most of whom were restaurant owners, who were talking about, we don't want to lose workers. What we're going to do is to reposition them, retrain them, and redeploy them. Uh, and so, for example, there are robots that are going to flip the hamburgers. So you don't need the guy uh, or uh, woman standing there uh, doing that. Uh, but you can redeploy those uh, individuals for other tasks within that restaurant. Uh, their restaurants, a lot of fast food uh, places are developing a kiosk uh, so you can order off of the menu as opposed to uh, from a, a human uh, being. Uh, but you're going to need greeters to basically direct people to the kiosk and kind of explain how it operates. So I think that's one sector that, at least in this early stage, they're thinking about how to balance work and innovation. This is also point out one company. This is, this is happening, obviously, but both at sort of some knowledge work as well as as well as sort of physical atom work. And so uh, Accenture, which is a big global consulting and, and IT firm, they're focused on that. Uh, they have a whole new sort of initiative inside the company on redeploying workers in this. And then that's one of the things that they're doing in their consulting uh, when they go out and consult with all the Fortune 500 companies. So there, there is, I think, uh, or I don't know if you've seen this or not, or agree with that. my sense is there's a growing realization among most major corporate among more major corporations that this is something they need to get right. I know, for example, the auto industry is, is thinking about proactively thinking about how do we deal with truck driver job loss and Uber loss and these kinds of things. So I think that's a little different than in the past where companies sort of just let it run and now there seems to be some effort to get out in front. Whether that gets translated into legislation uh, to help with other programs is another open question. Uh, just to build on that, I think something that I've found striking in, in the research on this is there's such a huge gap between uh, the academic literature and the business literature on these issues. And I guess I'm a little bit biased because I once was a management consultant, but um, you know the work that McKinsey and Bain do on these questions I find to be so much more sophisticated and thoughtful than the typical stuff coming out of more um, academic settings when they're actually trying to discuss both what is the trajectory that we're on um, and and what implications does that have and what are the very concrete business challenges because to that skills gap point this this ultimately is a, a business challenge to figure out how to make these things work with the workers that you have um, and and to the restaurant example there's um, Bain has an especially wonderful report that that I, I wish it had get, got more attention called spatial economics that made the point that one of the effects of things like automation is that it makes smaller scale operations more viable. And so restaurants example they use. Right now, the size of a metro you need to support a given restaurant is much higher than it would be if you could make it work with more technology and fewer workers. And so as we've seen with ATMs and other things, one effect isn't just in which jobs the workers are doing, which is key, but it also affects just where, where, what your footprint is, what your business model is, again, in ways that can be good for workers. Okay, other comments or questions? Go for it, Harry. Hi, um, I'm Harry Moser, the founder of the Reshoring Initiative, the opposite of offshoring, bringing manufacturing back. 
and uh, we agree a hundred percent with the, the emphasis on productivity and we believe that to get significant increase in productivity you need a lot more investment and to get investment it will only happen when companies are operating at a high level of capacity utilization and are profitable they need the capacity they they can afford the capacity and the easiest way to get them to that high level of you know, utilization is to do something about the trade deficit via the dollar via VAT tax via things like that so that the companies this, well, we will bring back about 40% increase in manufacturing when we balance the goods trade deficit, which will be more than enough to drive the, the investment that will produce the productivity that will keep all the workers very well employed. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to say something about that. I mean, I think, and, and Jim will continue to look for ways in which this is secretly protectionist language. Um, I, I think a really useful way to think about addressing the trade imbalance is in the same terms that I was just describing how we should think about the labor market generally, which is that if a market is producing a particular outcome, it's just responding to the conditions that it's operating in. Um, if we don't like the trade balance, the answer isn't a tariff or, you know, I think the Trump administration in, in one of their first rounds of negotiations with the Chinese, their first demand was reduce trade deficit by $200 billion, right? That's not a cognizable thing that you just do. But there are reasons a trading relationship comes out where it does. And so that's where, you know, something like Rob just described, the amount of investment we make on our side in our capabilities in advanced manufacturing actually matters a tremendous amount for where you would locate um, facilities. I think the behaviors and policies of other countries matter too, and we have to be prepared to confront those. Um, but there's no reason in principle, and there's no law of economics anywhere that says we shouldn't be doing manufacturing here, especially advanced high productivity manufacturing. And so I think it's um, it's it's not just why aren't, I, I love the term reshoring, because it's not just a question of how quickly things are going to leave. If we really believe in free trade, we should be wondering what are all the industries around the world that other people are moving their factories here for because we're the right place to make it. So maybe um, to clarify that point and, and maybe the tension between uh, Jim and, and, and Oren, Jim, you would agree, I, I would think, um, that it is a in the spirit of uh, free trade to more effectively enforce WTO rules around the world and to go after malefactors. And you can argue tactics, which is a different point, but you would argue that that's in the spirit of free trade. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's my first question. And the second would be that if we had done more of that uh, and done it better, that we would have had a more robust traded sector in the U.S. Not that we were going to keep every single T-shirt factory, uh, but we might have more. Well, but why, why shouldn't we keep the Pardon me? If what, we're fo if what we're focusing is on the worker and jobs, why shouldn't we keep the t-shirt factory here? I think, that, again, the logic of what Oren is arguing really is why, if, if, if a tariff will help the local steel producer, then we should, then we should have that tariff. Uh, I, that's not what I would want to do. And I'm also, and, and, and frankly, I'm skeptical that the real gains um, really won't come from, you know, trying to compete more with China uh, may, focusing on what we need to do to become more uh, technologically advanced, better educated, uh, more uh, more investment uh, in basic research. Well, I, I think we'll end up getting a lot more out of that than any sort of these punitive actions against China. No, um, I want to no, have Brinkman, but you so you you then don't agree that a more aggressive kind of enforcing would, WTO would rules is a good change? thing? But it, would, is, it, is that going to substantially change the trade balance, or I think more broadly, which I think it's the Oren's book. Is what is, is is he suggesting that that we could have done something radically different uh, since the 1970s with immigration and trade, um, which would have which would have saved all those factory jobs, which would you know which would have kept China at a three thousand you know per person a day per capita GDP? That that that, that I mean what I mean what does the alternate reality look like had we followed Oren's policy prescriptions? In you know, starting in the mid 1970s. Yeah, I'll, I'll just we have a much less open, a much less vibrant, a much less dynamic economy. We look a lot more like Europe. I'll just <clears throat> jump in, just so uh, Jim isn't battling alone on team piety. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, and Oren made a fair point uh, that I uh, that I uh, uh, sort of 
you know, underemphasize the differences between piety and productive pluralism by focusing on your uh, policy bottom lines that I agreed with and not talking much about uh, trade, immigration, and environmental policy, uh, and that's a fair point. So I, I, I uh, part of this is what we were talking about uh, beforehand. I just uh, get really bored saying the same thing a hundred times, and I, I, I was a, a trade policy guy for 20 years, and uh, and I've made those arguments a jillion times, and they're cropping up again, and I'm just too bored to make them again. But I, 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 I agree with Jim uh, that the counterfactual, I don't know what trade policy arrangements would have arrested uh, uh, the overall main thrust of changes in our occupational structure. Uh, I don't see, uh, I, I'm, I'm open to and sympathetic to the idea that that for our uh, national productive capacity, uh, more focus on uh, manufacturing uh, is uh, uh, is a good thing. Uh, but I don't see that as a uh, strategy for bringing back uh, mass blue collar employment. This high productivity manufacturing is not going to be an, empl uh, an employer of hard hats in the way that uh, the high tech industries of your automobiles and steel uh, were. Uh, so, uh, meanwhile, on the environmental side, I think uh, that uh, there's interesting points to Oren's argument, and I think it's, he makes some novel uh, uh, argumentative moves that are uh, interesting to think through. Uh, but big picture, I don't think higher environmental standards are the problem or that lowering our environmental standards is really the solution. I think it's, again, inevitable that as we get richer, we want our, uh, uh, to, we will pay relatively more attention uh, to, uh, uh, to our environmental amenities and to our own uh, uh, health and safety and so that our standards for environmental cleanliness and for health and safety are going to just naturally go up over time. Uh, to me, uh, the bigger problem uh, with environmental policy isn't high standards, it's uh, the kind of chronic, chaotic decision-making apparatus and the, the sort of paralyzed indecisiveness of environmental protection today, which contrasts uh, very unfavorably with other advanced countries that have high environmental standards. If you look at sort of uh, railroad track per mile or road per mile costs in the United States, they're insanely higher, uh, often multiples of, of, uh, of uh, corresponding figures in Europe where uh, it's not the Wild West, it's not laissez-faire, uh, but they have high environmental standards, they authorize people to enforce those standards, and then they trust that those authorities made the right call or they hold them accountable. Uh, what we have is an environment where nobody is ever trusted to make the final call, and we have litigation forever and uh, umpteen different veto points, and so things take forever. Uh, the uh, the person I think most associated with this argument is Philip Klein, uh, The Rule of Nobody, and, and other books uh, along those lines. I think that's an incredibly important problem in our, uh, in our regulatory uh, system, uh, but it's different from an a, a excessively high standards problem. Great. So we should, I promise everybody will stop, but, uh, or maybe you can just close, close us up with maybe two, three minutes of uh, final remarks. Yeah, sure. Can I actually can I ask Daryl a question as we wrap up? Uh, if Daryl has his answer, but the answer might not be two or three minutes. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, you let me know if you can answer in two or three minutes. Um, no, I just want to come back. I mean, I think the left of center versus right of center play on this is very interesting. So I'll both wrap something up, but want to come back to you quickly on one thing, um, because it's a question of sort of who, whose interests are we prioritizing, and something like this environmental standards question is a perfect example where. Yes, absolutely. As we become richer, we would gladly consume higher environmental quality at, at cost to the industrial economy. But that then all of a sudden opens up a really interesting question about inequality. I mean, we have people in our society at very different levels of wealth. And so the environmental quality that a someone with a graduate degree working at a think tank would optimize for and the environmental quality that someone trying to earn 35000 or $40,000 a year in an industrial job would, would optimize for, those are just different. And one of the key points that, that frustrates me about economic piety and that I emphasize in the book is if all you're talking about is GDP and consumption, it's just money, it's fungible, we can pass it around. If we start talking about these sort of questions of how we organize society, who we optimize for, um, then we actually get into, I think, what are much harder fights about whose balanced point in environmental quality counts at a given point in time. And so the, the last thing I just want to come back to, because something I struggle with is just what is the left of center work agenda. I agree there's a very clear left center agenda for helping people who are less skilled workers. But if the objective is um, we want less skilled people to be able to succeed in the labor market, find work that's going to allow them to support their 
families, not through redistribution. What are where, where are the opportunities for for working together? What do you what do you think should be at the top of that list? I mean, there were uh, things in your book that I would agree with, particularly on that front. I think all of us would agree that. Uh, low-skilled workers are the people particularly at risk from a variety of uh, different uh, things, uh, policies, uh, technology, uh, innovation, as well as uh, trade uh, practices. So the idea that not everybody has to go to college and we should have a very strong vocational education sector, uh, I'm 100 percent on board uh, with that. Uh, I guess uh, the thing that I worry about in terms of our current uh, policies is tax policies and how they have uh, been disadvantageous uh, for uh, uh, workers and another thing I liked about your book, uh, and it was refreshing to uh, hear this, uh, was just uh, uh, kind of the idea that you know much of the tax policy has been uh, the benefits have gone to the wealthy, and we need to rethink that. Uh, and so I think you know that certainly would be a, a point of commonality. Great. So maybe we could all agree: uh, tax rich people, not robots. <laughs> if we had to choose, we <laughs> have to choose. <laughs> Uh, so um, before I just finish and close, um, on your seat, and if you're in the audience you can't see it, but it's on our website, we have a, a plethora, a bounty of events for some strange reason, a bunch of different reasons for doing a lot of events between now and Christmas. But one I would just uh, uh, commend you to look at, given that it's very related to this, it's an event we're doing on December 5th on uh, high performance work organizations in manufacturing. Uh, really interesting ideas that you can organize manufacturing in two ways, sort of more just low skill, low wages, which is what Warren is talking about not having. And you can also organize them in ways that get high wages, uh, higher productivity, uh, higher benefits. Uh, and uh, so we've got some really interesting speakers and, and companies coming in to talk about how to do that in the role of government. Um, so with that, uh, I would uh, also encourage you to buy Oren's book. I, I think you're like me. I don't care if anybody reads my book um, or Daryl's book or Brink's. It's all about buying and, not, not, and buying new, by the way. You, buying used on Amazon is not, not appropriate. Uh, <laughs> it's legal, but it's not Stocking appropriate. stuffer. That's right. There you go. Uh, there you go. So uh, please join me in thanking not just Oren, but the three great panelists this morning, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>